Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this evening I'm delighted to be joined by Colin Watt and Laura Bradburn for the post-match reaction podcast on a Celtic State of Mind. Colin, I said I've got four entries in my book here in the second half. Two of them were substitutions. That wasn't great, was it? That's uh, kind of some of the season, isn't it? It's just been a, a horrible watch. I mean, that's 45 minutes of your life you're not getting back. For anybody that watched that, um, well, before what, what we before we, we draw uh, the ana- the analysis out of you, Colin, um, on Twitter, the Bears Den Baroness asked, "Any game other than Lisbon 1967 that you could have attended in the history of Celtic Football Club? Have a think about that. It certainly wouldn't be tonight, would it? No, uh, and I've already seen Celtic win away in, in Rome because you, you bring it up all the time. But if I was to pick one out, it would be the 5-0 game at Love Street. That would be the game I'd go back and watch. We, um, we more scoring in the lime green kit. Yep. yep. Brilliant. Yes, what about yourself, Laura? Do you know, it's a funny one. Um, this is going to sound totally uh, ridiculous to say, but my, um, my uncle and my granddad... Uh, drove a car to Milan for the final in 1970 and uh, although we didn't win the match I'd love to have been on that road trip <laughs> Amazing, following the uh, Leeds United semi-final defeat at Hamden and Ellen Road, yeah but tonight not from the Celtic vintage uh, nothing to write home about the second half the concern for me was you know, the, there just wasn't anything at all really to resemble the you know the first 35 minutes and as you were saying Colin it's been a story of the season we, we can just taper off and that's exactly what happened interestingly enough there was a wee bit of comment in relation to the first half performance of Sorrow Celtic trends on Twitter um, pulled up the stats 93% pass success rate were you surprised at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you probably see a lot about um, you don't see what Sorrow does, it's the stuff that he, he does wrong that you pick up on um, and as I said, I felt as if he grew into that game um, and for me, I didn't think it was the right thing to take him off. Um, if you're going to bring Brown on, you bring him on to kind of show it up. We were still getting a, a bit over overawed in the midfield and taking like for like just it wasn't working it all kind of went downhill in the second half for me when we sw- we stopped going two up front um, and the substitution to go one up. You're then on the park at that time. You've got Turnbull, Rogic, and Christie. You're back to that three number 10 scenario that we had the other day. Um, and it clearly doesn't work. I don't know why, if it didn't work the other day, why you try it again just in case it, it works this time. Why not bring on someone like Lee Griffiths? Why wait that time to bring on someone like Patrick Clamalla who... By that time, the game was never going to allow him to get himself into it. The, the, the game had already gone past the point of Celtic actually attacking. You heard it on the commentary. They turned around and said that the, the changes coming on were defensive changes. It was only 1-0. If Aberdeen had scored a goal, we were never going to score a second. You know, the two up front position, Laura, we've been talking about Eduard much preferring to play with a partner. I think you've seen that. Gordon Strachan speaks about it. He likes to drop off, come deep, get the ball, sometimes even in his own half, and then he knows that he has someone further up the park. Are you becoming concerned at the 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 lack of quality that we're now seeing in Ayeti. I mean, looking at him tonight, I wasn't impressed. That's, that's the last two times I've seen him where I've been far from impressed. We keep hearing about his calibre, his £5 million price tag. I'm not buying that you, you're not fit um, in the middle of February, nearing the end of February. Cannot accept that whatsoever. He's a Swiss internationalist. We've seen some flashes in the first half dozen games which suggested he was going to be a great signing. I'm just not seeing it now. Is this a concern for you? Yeah, I would say so. Like you say, there there shouldn't be any professional footballer um, at, at February in a season that starts at the end of summer or, or, or a bit later as it did this year, um, who's still unfit at this point in the season. You can make an argument for match sharpness or, or, or something like that, um, whether that's an issue, um, because obviously he's not getting a lot of uh, first-team uh, action. 
but but fitness is an issue. Um, I, I I said before before the game started that I thought it was too early to write him off. But with every passing game, you know, you're you, you're finding yourself thinking we really need to we really need to see something from him pretty soon. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a busted flush. You know, the, I think uh, Tam McManus on on Twitter tweeted that between him and uh, him and Clamalla, you're talking about nearly £9 million of, of money basically down the drain at this point and, and that's not an amount that we can afford to waste at the best of times Now Sean comes back in, Sean Keo, welcome back on Twitter, we did burst through the 9,500 subscribers mark during that first half, the second half actually so thanks for getting involved second half was dire, I can't um, disagree with that we stopped doing all the things we were doing well now uh, Funkman 05 comes in to say the radio columns are depressing they just waffle mixed with the game we were going live through the games weren't we Colin until we realised that yep. uh, sometimes the, th- the actual uh, streams that we were watching were way behind the live streams that other people were watching and we were getting text messages to tell us for example that Ferenc Varos had scored another goal and we didn't know about it so we, we kind of sacked that idea and we just do the pre-match half time and full time Owen McGrandall's it's progress. Turnbull lasted 81 minutes and Lennon we trust. Colin, uh, I've already asked the question about are you concerned about the lack of quality that we're getting out of Yeti? Are you concerned that Turnbull can't finish a game? Do you know, I actually did look this up. So he has finished two games this season. It was the two games after the, the Dubai debacle. It was the Hibs game when he scored pretty much towards the last minutes and then the following Livingston game. He played the 90 minutes in both of those games. He also, in his five appearances for Motherwell this season, played 90 minutes three times. So he can last 90 minutes. And again, in a day like today, when it's that close and you're looking for someone to maybe create something in the last 10, 15 minutes to set up someone like Klamala to score a goal, then (laughs) why why take them off the park? I mean, the the midfielders you'd already brought on, you didn't need to do that. Um, taking Eddie off as well I, I don't understand the substitutions at all I was just looking at the stats there we had three shots on target um, at home three shots on target now I didn't think it was that close a game that we, we weren't going to create the, the, the chances um, but to only get three on target is, is really really poor when you say that about Albin Ayeti he didn't have a single shot tonight did he really get the service to even get into those positions? The best chance I can think of in the second half that wasn't Ryan Christie's lob, which for anyone that's watching, it was a very good attempt. It was a very good attempt at goal. Um, but the, the best chance apart from that was the one that was cut back and Turnbull just couldn't get it out of his feet. If he'd laid it off to Odds and Edward, there's, he probably had a better chance at goal. Um, but apart from that, there's nothing really to shout home about. No, there isn't. So some people are coming on and saying, stop moaning. But we're analysing the, the full game. I think we started off well. I think for 30 to 35 minutes, we looked as though we were going to win this. Not at a canter, but I think we were going to win it and it was going to be convincing. Uh, you're looking at a 2 or a 3 nothing. Aberdeen are on a rotten running form. That's them now played 10 1 1. Do you think, you know, under the circumstances, Laura, that the knee jerk reaction to uh, manage runs that we've seen maybe at Kilmarnock is something that obviously we've, we've not witnessed that at Celtic Aberdeen are going to see through this season through, see out the season despite the bad run they're not going to make a knee jerk reaction are they? No, I, I think it was interesting uh, Neil Lennon's comments yesterday I, I think you alluded to it that uh, you know, he was as much talking about himself as he was talking about Derek McInnes when he uh, said, you know, that he hopes he gets the time that he needs and, and that kind of thing. And that certainly seems to be the 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 route that Aberdeen are taking. Um, I don't always think it's the correct route, especially in the case of, of, of Celtic, where, where we've kind of fallen off a cliff as far as things are concerned compared to last season. Um, because I, you very rarely find a situation, I think, in modern football where a manager goes through a patch as bad as either the one that Derek McInnes has gone through or the one that Neil Lennon's going through. Uh, you very rarely find a situation where they turn it round and remain at the club. You know, whether it takes two or three games or whether it takes half a season, they usually end up out the door at some point. And uh, and I wouldn't be surprised in either case if that happens to, to both of them. 
Now, I'm keen to get the thoughts of uh, a wide range of Celtic supporters on the show on a daily basis, Colin. So let's have a look at some of the comments coming in. Eno Sullivan is commenting on YouTube. I was really pleased with how we defended for a change. However, can one of you, and I'm going to throw this to you, Colin. Tell me, what's Neil Lennon's obsession with Ryan Christie? Does he not trust his strikers? We've we've spoken all season about Ryan Christie. I'm a big fan. I can see his deficiencies. Of course I can. I am expecting him to be moved on in the summer. I think that under a different coach, he might be a far more effective player. I'm not blaming Neil Lennon for uh, Ryan Christie's performances. Of course I'm not. But we have seen the good and the bad of Ryan Christie. Let's first of all take the first point from Ian Colin. Let's look at the defence and mm-hmm. also let's give a wee bit of credit to Scott Bain. I thought Bain played okay today as well. Yeah, no, definitely his role in the goal um, can't be understated. Getting the ball out quicker, quickly to McGregor, uh, McGregor's pass to Turnbull, um, the fact that he carried the ball so far and laid it off. Don't know what Aberdeen players are thinking about giving David Turnbull that amount of space. Um, but yeah, fantastic goal. And then right at the death there, um, he had to be brave to come out to the feet to gather the ball because Aberdeen were really throwing everything at us for the last couple of minutes there um, and just being able to, to kind of win the free kick and kill the game off, it was really impressive uh, Christopher Iyer wins man of the match today and it's very hard to argue against that, I thought he was a very calming influence at the back, you could see that he was getting the best out of Stephen Welsh alongside him as well I'm um, just noticing here that John Kennedy's doing the uh, post-match press conference on Celtic TV um, so if anyone's watching, let us know what he's saying. Uh, but yeah, defensively, I thought we, we played well. Just the way that Celtic's playing this season, with the way that Aberdeen were attacking us for that last five, ten minutes, you're just expecting something to end up in the back of the net. Um, the, the fact that it didn't kind of shows that, uh, the kind of position we're in this season. Um, and yeah, I'm sure everybody that played in that back four tonight will be delighted with their, their clean sheet. Um, they'd certainly put the effort in for it. Now, on the subject of strikers, there's loads of comments coming through. I've got to say, none of them really positive in relation to a Yeti. Brian Murphy comes in, Laura, on YouTube to say a Yeti and Paddy are not of Celtic quality. There's a lot of comments coming in about Albiana Yeti. Do you think we're being a little bit harsh maybe on Patrick Clamalla? Has he had enough games? Is it about time he got a run in the team? I certainly don't think you can judge him on tonight. I think Colin said earlier that um, he was brought on at a point in the game where we weren't really looking to push forward. We were trying to batten down the hatches and obviously that's not going to be where where his strengths lie. Um, I, I personally don't think he's had enough of a chance, but then you've got to ask the question, why is he not getting that chance? Is it is it because of a, a lack of uh, proper judgment on the part of the coaching staff, which we've already uh, queried because of how long it took Soro and Turnbull to get into the team, or is it because they're seeing something on the training pitch that means that he's not, you know, suitable for for selection? Um, I I think he deserves a, a, a longer run at it. It's it's where he's going to get that opportunity. I don't know because. You have to think that between now and the end of the season, any time that Edward is available, uh, he's got to play. And probably the same with Griffiths, to be honest, if he is fit and able, um, he probably has to play because he's got the scoring record to prove that he's worth it. Now, Ian McIntosh comes in via YouTube to say that he feels a Yeti looked disinterested. I think Red Scotland makes a decent point to say that a Yeti's ability to make the ball stick is very good. And um, it does look as though he's got one of these unfortunate um, knacks, Colin, looking disinterested. I remember a lot of people used to get frustrated with Samaras uh, for the exact same reason. The body language uh, made you wonder if he was interested or not. You see it a lot, even with uh, Odds and Edward. If Edward goes through a wee patch where he's not playing that great, um, there's a lot of people saying, oh, he's not interested, get Lee Griffiths in. The striker can only feed off the service they're getting uh, up to them. And as I said, we only had three shots on target tonight. Um, so it's it's difficult when you're not getting the ball uh, to create the chances. Uh, there was a period in the first half when, and just backing up on what Red Scotland said there, he picked the ball up, I think it was about 35, 40 yards from goal, kind of done a, a, a shimmy, got kept the ball, played it out to the, the wing. His ability to hold the ball up um, should make up that he's a good um, striker up front with two. He's not a lone striker. He needs someone playing off him. 
And we've said that probably about every Celtic striker. I don't think there is a Celtic striker out there that's suited to being one up front. Now, Lee Griffiths obviously scored 40 goals in one season playing as a lone striker. But when you take that season out of context, it's not the way Lee Griffiths plays. He's always best with someone alongside him. We've been yearning for the partnership up front of Eddie and Griffiths. We see what that can do. Um, I, I just never think we should be playing one up front at home, especially in the league. Now you have spoken about Griffiths Every time he's out the team We get loads of people commenting That he should be back in it Colin uh, But one person who doesn't seem to get A lot of criticism Who doesn't seem to get a lot of comments In relation to the fact that he, he plays Week in week out is Callum McGregor And uh, Paul Goggins comes in to say McGregor never gets subbed He was anonymous yet again Is it about time Laura To rest McGregor He plays a hell of a lot of games And has done for a number of seasons yeah, well, that's what kind of baffles me about the amount of times that uh, David Turnbull's taken off the pitch because you would anticipate that if he needs a rest as much as, as he does, then surely you could split that between him and Callum McGregor and it would it would make no difference. Um, I, I do think that Callum McGregor is, is riding a little bit this, on season, this season on the goodwill of, of seasons gone by. I don't think he's had... He's had far from the best season that I think he's had in a Celtic shirt. Even tonight was a good example of, you know, there's a lot of other players take a lot of uh, sticks, Scott Brown uh, being one of them for, for straight passes and, and, and giving the ball away a lot. Um, Callum McGregor doesn't get that uh, criticism most of the time because he doesn't uh, merit it. But, you know, tonight was an example of a situation where he was probably more of a liability than he was a help and yet like you say I, I, he doesn't seem to get picked up for it um, I don't think that goodwill is going to continue to last for much longer if the if the performances don't improve pretty quickly Do you no. know what's quite interesting on sorry Paul, do you know what's quite interesting on that I just looked up, I don't know everyone uses different um, apps on their phone to check the scores and stuff I use one called ThoughtMob um, and it gives you a breakdown and people go in and rate who's been the best player and they give a, a match rating. Callum McGregor was rated the highest out of the Celtic team on that tonight. And you look at um, McGregor's performances this season, he's played 29 games in the league, scored three goals with seven assists, including tonight. Ryan Christie's only scored four goals with seven assists. And OK, Ryan Christie gets the abuse, but Ryan Christie's playing in a further forward position. We've got Callum McGregor sitting very deep this season. He's kind of sitting just in front of the back four, almost as if we're playing two defensive midfielders. How good McGregor can be was basically that period when he set up David Turnbull, getting the ball, driving forward, actually building the play from the back, using the midfield to drive forward, linking up with Turnbull and letting him take the shot. Um, I think Callum McGregor is a, a very good player for Celtic and I think the problem is is Celtic as a whole haven't been playing great but Callum McGregor's still doing the kind of role that he always does he picks the ball up he always makes himself available um, and he tries to get into the gaps you saw it in the second half when he drived into the box that was the one I was just talking about a couple of minutes ago with the cutback and David Turnbull kind of scuffed the shot a lot of what Callum McGregor does is probably underappreciated at Celtic and if he wasn't there you would probably notice it a wee bit like James A. Forrest who hasn't been in the side for most of the season Colin now I find this interesting coming in on YouTube Yeti and Christy can go with Barkas and Duffy because I think we're all of the same opinion that Duffy will not uh, be at Celtic Park next season his loan, loan deal will end and he'll get sent back down to Brighton it's not worked out for him and uh, that's just the way it happens from time to time Christy seems to be uh, pushing for a move as Colin uh, suggested earlier on in the show tonight um, but I think Ayeti and Barkas is going to be more difficult These there's £10 million worth of players uh, one of whom is sitting on the bench languishing on the bench and the other after tonight's performance who will probably be joining them in the next game on the bench on Sunday night Laura do we have a £10 million problem uh, very much like you know what Martin O'Neill inherited when he took over at Celtic and he had Berkovic and Raphael Scheidt £10 million worth of Sorry, I mean that's his name. Ten million pound worth of players who really haven't contributed a great deal this season. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we should maybe call him Raphael Jobby from now on. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think uh, I think as far as um, I think they 
they kind of fall into slightly different categories for me. Um, for example, we were talking about Clamalla maybe not getting enough opportunities. Um, I think a, a Yeti still falls into that category. Maybe so does Barkas, whereas Duffy has has played enough games for you to make your decision. So I, I think there's still a little bit of leeway with some of those players that you could say, well, there's still an opportunity for them to improve. I don't, I don't believe Barkas... Uh, you know, lost his ability to be a goalkeeper on the flight from Greece to Glasgow. He, he, there must be something there. There must be there must be an ability there that's just not been tapped into for whatever reason. So I would be willing to, you know, to give him another shot because I think five million uh, is a lot for a goalkeeper at any time, uh, never mind uh, for a Scottish team to pay. So I, I, I don't think you can afford to, to give up on him that easily. Ajeti and Klamala... Like I say, they've they've not really had as much opportunity in the team and I would like to see them given a, a bigger opportunity. Because the other problem you have then is if, if Edward goes in the summer and then you decide that Klamala and Ajeti aren't aren't worth their salt and, and you put them out the door, you're then in a position where you've only got Lee Griffiths if he happens to stay and you've got to then plough money into trying to get new strikers, which are the most expensive on the market. And it just creates a whole new can of worms. And, and I don't know that we would be able to guarantee that we could bring somebody in that will that will do the job from the off. We're going to have a wee chat about Lee Griffiths because there's a lot of comments coming in about him. But before we do that, Philip DeMarco, who is a regular contributor to the show, has come on to say, not sure what game these three negative people watch pure impulsive and attacking football beautiful Philip I think your YouTube account has been hacked uh, Joseph McGonigal is Lee Griffith's Celtic career up how often have we asked that particularly this season Colin is his career up and Paul O'Donnell comes in to ask Lennon not picking Griff or State um, is just out of spite you look at Lee Griffiths the situation that he's in Colin we know what he's capable of he's 30 years of age he's probably lost two years of his Celtic career all in he's now fourth choice striker at Celtic Park Mm -hmm. is it a case of getting back in or you know has he played um, his final his final hand at Celtic has he let the gaffer down once too often is Neil Lennon now looking at the likes of Clamalla and knowing that he's nowhere near the level of a finisher that Neil Lee Griffiths is but he's shown the right attitude and he's in better shape so he's going to get more opportunities I, I really don't know what it is with Lee Griffiths because um, he was in the press and he actually threw his weight behind the manager saying everyone's behind him and then the next game he finds himself on the bench despite the fact he'd actually been playing well up until that point, he's only started seven games for Celtic this season. And for someone of the the calibre of Lee Griffiths, someone that what you know you're going to get out of him, that's nowhere near enough. To have scored five goals in seven games as well, OK, he's played 15 in total, but a lot of those have been 10, 15 minute appearances off the bench. I don't know what it is with Lee Griffiths. If there's a new manager comes in, he would have a clean slate and he would have the chance to prove himself. And for that reason, I'd probably keep him for next season. But if the management position isn't going to change, I think what you'll find is Lee Griffiths will be out the door in the summer. What's your thoughts on that yourself, Laura? Is that um, at 30, you think you could maybe get another couple of years out of Lee Griffiths? I think, you know, undoubtedly, if you played him week in, week out, even with his conditioning issues, he would get you goals. Generally, domestically, he would get you goals. He must himself, as a professional, have one eye on the the Euros as well. Um, You know, he'll be wanting to get involved in that as a Scottish striker. It, It may well be his last chance to be involved in the finals. What's your thoughts on Lee Griffiths? Does he still have a future at Celtic Park? I think it's a difficult one because uh, on paper alone, looking at um, somebody of his ability, uh, 30 is certainly not an age where he's completely over the hill. You you, you would like to think that he still can uh, deliver something to the team and provide something for the team. I think if you look at the inconsistency with which he's been able to deliver that over the last couple of years, that puts a, a massive question mark on things. Um, I... I personally don't see him having a future. I, I think, I think the ship sailed unless, of course, Lennon goes before the end of the season and, and he's re- reinvigorated under a new manager, whoever that that may be. That's the only chance I see him having uh, any kind of a future at Celtic. Otherwise, I think probably he's going to be one of the ones headed for the door. 
Now, Graham Martin comes in to remind us that Berkovic did play well for Celtic in some games. He was outstanding, absolutely. I remember actually a game against Kilmarnock during the week, uh, an evening game, where he scored and he, he gave us the get it up you sign. I think he scored twice that night. And he also scored twice against Rangers, didn't he? And he done the old um, chicken tonight dance when he scored one of the goals. Yeah, he absolutely did. And I remember also a game against Aberdeen, as it happens, under John Barnes, 7 nothing, And he was outstanding that day as well. And we had like a forward line that consisted of Larson, Maravchik, Berkovic, and who was the other one? Viduka. Now, now you're talking about playing three number tens. There was there was a, a managerial headache that you quite like to have. That was a dilemma you like to have having that talent uh, in front of you. But again, I'm concerned that you can't really cut your losses on a player that's had a, a, a poor, poor season like Barkas. I mean, if he was to go back to Greece, even though, as Colin rightly said, he, he's came second in a, a Greek poll in relation to the footballers recently, Colin. I mean, you would be struggling to get any anything like £5 million back for your investment. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> it's only, be, I guess, the reason you won't get anything back near the £5 million is because in the performances... Um, they haven't been the worst but the manager's never backed them he comes out and says he's his number one goalkeeper um, brings him back in plays him at Ibrox and then a couple of weeks later comes out and says no Bain's my number one goalkeeper you we're sitting in, in January, February and you don't know who your number one is what kind of confidence is that going to give to the, the guys that's got the gloves what did Conor Hazard ever do to get the gloves taken off him well, so, uh, the thing is, I remember the game, the Scottish Cup final, Laura, you covered it here on Axom, and obviously he was criticised for at least one of the goals, and I think he flapped against uh, Hibs uh, as well uh, in a 2-2 game, I believe, if I'm, my mind serves me correctly. Um, but obviously he was, he was one of the heroes of that game, he, he saved a couple of penalties, and I think when I was making the, the uh, comparison between Welsh and Duffy, you know, where Welsh has come in and you'd pick him every single day of the week. I was of the same kind of view when it came to Conor Hazard. Why not play him every other week? It's the only way he's going to learn. It's the only way he's going to develop. The other player that has disappeared off the face of the earth, obviously he's on the bench, is Diego Luxol. Uh, he's on 22 grand a week, uh, reminds us uh, Mick R. Has yet to make an assist. It's frightening. Yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, Laura, about this. So obviously with loan deals, there's loads of tie-ins with loan deals and sometimes you have to pay money if they don't play I would guess that that's not the case with Lax Salt because he's not playing at all and other times if they, if they play a percentage of the games then you pay an extra instalment of the, the loan fee it does seem unusual that Lax Salt isn't being utilised at all doesn't it? Yeah, I think um, I think we were talking about earlier on how the um, how Greg Taylor was getting more of an opportunity and that, that is a good thing for him. Um, but it does make you question, like you say, what the what the motives behind Laxalt being put out are. Because he, he, he came in and he was strong and he looked like a quality player and he looked like a real upgrade from what we had. Um, so, so to not see him um, in the team now is, is a bit of a mystery, but um, but he did seem to, like we said about some of the other players, seem to sort of revert to type as far as the, the players around him were concerned. But this is this goes back to the, the issue that I think I raised last Friday when I was on with Jim Orn. Um, I said how, you know, loans can be financially so damaging because you end up in a situation where you think it's not worth pers- persisting with a player that's going to be out the door in six months or whatever, and yet you're still having to play the, pay these gargantuan wages that you've agreed to pay. So um, it's it's not worked out. I don't think he'll be missed when he does go, but um, it's, it's, it's all a bit of a mystery and it's another just indication of how poorly managed the situations are for, for certain players in the team. Turnbull's not been managed well, I don't think. Soros not been managed well. Um, as, as Colin said about the goalkeeping situation, you, you ended up in a situation where he's... He, he's kind of busted the confidence of the three of them in one fell swoop so there, there's wider issues there than just lacks out but it's just another indication of how poorly the squad has been managed this season yeah hey, you're spot on, Laura. yeah I mean you'll take a look at it see if we had a, a young left back coming through you would rather see him on the bench and then you could end lacks out's loan deal if that was possible if you had another centre half coming through you would end Shane Duffy's loan deal because you know now you're just looking forward to what's to come next season. You're already looking forward. He did that in the last couple of days by bringing in guys like Liam Shaw. 
you want to see what's there um, for next season. You know you're starting again fresh. Who's going to stay? Who's going to go? Lennon must know the players that are probably going to move on next season. He needs to see what he's got there in front of them. The, the kind of board need to see what's there in front of them. What assets have they got to sell? If you can save 60 grand a week by sending Diego Laxalt and Shane Duffy back to their respective clubs, that's something you've got to do because what, what else are you paying the money for? There's no point paying them to sit on the bench if you've got youngsters that can come through and do the same job. No, you're absolutely right. Now, fair play to uh, Brandon Coyle, who tried to play the part on the comments of the, the capo. And he came in three times, but no one responded. But uh, fair play to you, Brandon. You did come come on to say, come on, you boys in green. And again, and again. And everybody ignored you. <laughs> so I thought you'd done well. And, and again, uh, Glasgow's green and white. I hope you're having a good night, Brandon, um, after that performance. I certainly always enjoy the chat. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us in uh, the comment section, either on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. As I said earlier, we've smashed through the 9,500 subscribers mark on YouTube. Please continue to subscribe. And you'll get notifications every time we put out a new show. Not only on Axon, there's a few other football shows on the channel, one of which is is from our very own Amy Canavan, whose first episode of the Soccer Supernova is this Sunday night, where she will be interviewing Jock Brown. Interesting times for Celtic back then, so tune in and watch her interview with Jock Brown. Uh, you will not be disappointed. All that's left for me to say tonight on an evening where Celtic made it six in a row is uh, thank you to Colin Watt and Laura Bradburn for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. 